Next, we're going to see how we can extend simple exponential smoothing to include both trends and seasonal components. Holtz model, which is also known as double exponential smoothing, adds a trend component to the standard SES model. Here, we see that rather than use a single equation, Holtz model evolves using two equations. From the top, the first thing we see is that the H step ahead forecast depends on two things, LT, which will be the level, and BT, which is the trend. We also see that it depends on H times BT. That is, the further you go in the future, the more important the trend becomes. This is sensible, since if you have a trending system, the longer you go, the further the system will move away from the present value. If we look at each of the two equations in Holtz model, we see the level equation looks very similar to what we saw in SES. In particular, the level depends on the most recent value multiplied by alpha, the smoothing parameter, plus one minus alpha times the previous, not just level, but now level and trend. But in fact, what this value here is, is this is x hat t given t minus one. That is, this is the forecast we had at time period t given the information at t minus one. So it depends on these two things. The level has also a sort of SES-like structure. However, now it's gonna have a different parameter, beta, which allows it to have a different sort of level of smoothing. But the key difference here is really the shock. So the shock to this trend is not just a function of xt, but in fact depends on the difference between the levels across two consecutive periods. So we think about why this might make sense. So imagine you have a, a sort of time series that's sort of trending up very strongly. So you have a few observations of it here. Think about the level. Well, the difference of the level over periods, in fact, is a reasonable measure of the trend. And so what, what, what Holtz model does is it uses the sort of innovation to the level to measure the trend, and then it smooths that out. So if you have a series that's sort of upward trending, you'd expect these to be positive differentials, in which case then you'll sort of forecast a positive trend. A big difference with Holtz model from say other models we've seen where the trend has a constant parameter is that the trend is, is completely flexible here. In particular, the trend itself will have random walk behaviors. And so it's allowed to change over time. It can adapt to sort of whatever the process needs. This can be an advantage in some situations if the trend is somewhat non-stable although it can also be a disadvantage if you have a series that's growing at a, a fairly consistent rate. To understand the model a little bit, we can do some recursive substitution to sort of get a sort of view of it, in particular as two exponential smoothers, which is why it's called double exponential smoothing. So we start from the model as is, then I'm not gonna substitute for BT, so I'm just gonna pull BT down to the next line, but I'm simply gonna substitute for LT using the equation above, so we see that obviously we're gonna get one minus, we're gonna get xt, alpha xt, plus one minus alpha times the level and the trend. So we can do the same thing again, as I can substitute in for lt to get lt minus one, we get an xt minus one, and of course I'm gonna get a bt minus one. So we've just substituted in a few times. And what we end up with after a couple of substitutions starts to look a bit pretty, look familiar to what we've seen from simple exponential smoothing. So we have alpha xt, alpha one minus alpha xt minus one. You can imagine if we had another term there, it would be alpha one minus alpha squared xt minus two and so on. But of course we don't have that. What we have instead is just a smoothed level, two periods in the past. So that looks pretty much like a standard exponential smoother there. But then we have a second term here, which depends only on the B terms. So we have BT, one minus alpha BT, one minus alpha squared BT. So in fact, we can see we also have a sort of decaying series there. And you, know, you can imagine if you go forward a few more, there's gonna be a pretty obvious pattern here. So we're gonna have a the sort of first step is gonna look exactly what we think about. So the level depends only on the exponentially weighted moving average of X, but, the actual forecast depends on the exponentially weighted moving average of bt minus j.
So we have two exponential smoothers here, not just one as we had in simple exponential smoothing. This adds the additional flexibility to handle, say, a trend that's evolving relatively slowly, or in fact may be nearly constant. So as we mentioned on the previous slide, Holt's model has two exponential smoothers. Each of the BT terms themselves are exponential smoothers, and so obviously they depend on the innovation to the levels. So the innovation to the levels, you know, is depend just on the difference of the levels, which again makes sense. If the levels are sort of changing in a consistent way, that's an indication there's a trend. On the other hand, if the series is not trending, then you think the levels should be fairly constant themselves. The two parameters in this model are alpha and beta. Those are usually estimated by least squares, just like we did in SES. There are also two initial values needed to start the recursions of the two exponential smoothers, L0 and B0. So these can be fitted just like they could in simple exponential smoothing, or instead they can be calibrated, which is fairly common. So again, we use the same calibration value for L0, that is X1. We also use sort of, can use sort of any estimate of the trend, just the difference between x at some period n and x1, divided by the number of periods, n minus 1. And again, if you had to say there's a common choice, the common choice is simply n2, which is just going to be x2 minus x1, divided by 2 minus 1, or just x2 minus x1. So that's the sort of standard choice that one would actually see in a lot of sort of software. If you don't want to estimate the parameters, it's a simple way to do it. Again, like SES, as long as the parameters alpha and beta are sort of somewhere in the interval between 0 and 1, not on the boundary, then one would expect these initial values to not matter too much once t is moderately large. In shorter samples, they may be a bit more important. There's an additional wrinkle we can use when we're using Holtz model, which is to use what are called damp trends. So this adds a third parameter to the model. So instead of alpha and beta, we'll now have a third parameter, which is phi. And the, the role of this parameter is to damp the trend. So we saw before we had a term in the forecast, which was h times bt. This implies as h gets large, you continue along the current trend. So whatever the trend is, if bt was positive, then every period you go in the future, the trend would simply become larger and larger in a linear manner. Damping reduces the growth of the trend. In particular, the parameter phi shows up in the h-step equation as phi plus phi squared plus phi to the h times bt. So the first thing we see, if phi is 1, then immediately we get back the previous model. So we obviously need to think about phi being less than 1 for this to be interesting. The other thing we see is we've seen this a lot in the past, is when we have sort of sequences like this, we know these are convergent as long as phi is less than 1 in absolute value. And in fact, we know the long run value of the series is phi over 1 minus phi. So in fact, for large h, the damped model, instead of having a trend that continues to grow as long as the sample is going up, it will actually have a trend that, that sort of moderates or in fact damps and can stops growing. To sort of try to think about what the two might look like, imagine we had a positive trend. We want to think about the trend component to growth. So without damping, we're simply going to have some sort of straight line as we go sort of into the future. So this is sort of h getting large. On the other hand, when we have damping, you know, and again, we'll sort of assume a phi as sort of a reasonable value, say 0.9. At first, it's going to be very similar because, of course, 0.9 plus 0.9 squared, it's a little bit less than 2, but it's not a lot less than 2. But as we go sort of further in the future, in fact, we're going to asymptote, and there's going to, in fact, be a maximum value you're going to get from the trend contribution. So instead of continuing to diverge over large horizons, you're going to sort of have a local growth, but you're not going to have growth forever. In practice, this is as sort of shown to be a useful property for these models. We usually want phi to be large. This is, in fact, usually enforced. We want it to be large, but not too large. As I mentioned before, if phi is close to 1, then it's difficult to tell the difference between the damped and the non-damped trend, so we don't really want it to be 1. On the other hand, if phi is very small, very close to 0, then Holt's model, in fact, will reduce to the standard simple exponential smoothing, because if there's no trend, then we have simple exponential smoothing, we just have a random walk type model, or an IMA, and so we don't need to, to worry about that there. So the common thing to do is when estimating the parameters, is to restrict this sort of damping parameter phi to lie in the range from about 0.8 to 0.98, so not too close to 1, so you do eventually see some, some differences, 
but also not too small so that you actually get it. Of course, if you end up with a prior estimates on the, on the boundary, that might be an indication that it's not a great model. If phi gets particularly small, then you might want to use just simple exponential smoothing. If phi is particularly large, you might want to just use Holt's model. Finally, Holt's model can be further extended into another model, which is known as Holt-Winters, which is going to add additional exponential smoothing. So now, instead of just level and trend, we're going to have a seasonal component as well. So seasonal component is going to capture the fact that seasonalities are, are common in many data series, but it's also going to do it using this sort of same idea as we've had in the previous sort of methods, which is going to use an exponential smoother, but now of seasonal terms. So before, we'll start from the top, the forecasting equation. So we have xt plus h depends on the level, h times the trend, so no difference there from Holt's method. But now we add a sort of new parameter, which is this st plus h minus m k plus 1. k is defined down here. It's the sort of floor operator of h minus 1 over m. This is just sort of basically, it's going to sort of roll us around a number of sort of forecasts. But we'll take a look at that in just a second. So the level equation gets modified a little bit. So again, it's still an exponential smoother. You can see it. It has the same smoothing trend there. It has a different shock. In particular, it's, it's xt, the most recent value, but minus st minus m. That is minus the previous seasonal component, m periods ago. So here, again, we assume that m is the number of seasons. So for example, with monthly data, m would be 1, 2, through 12. So you have 12 months of data, so you have 12 seasonal components. Um, you could have, say, quarterly data, which is m would be 4, but m measures the number of seasonal components. So what we want to do there is we want to think about the innovation in xt in excess of the seasonal component exactly one season ago in the previous observation. So that's not why it's t minus 1, but it's t minus m. So that's how we update the level. The trend, in fact, has, has no changes, so it just depends on the changes in the level plus the smooth value. The seasonal has a shock. The seasonal shock is, again, the surprise relative to the level and the trend. So intuitively, if we had a series that had no seasonal component, then we wouldn't expect there to be any systematic deviation between xt and the level and the trend, because those would be the, the fundamental drivers of the series. On the other hand, if you had a seasonal component, then once I know the level and the trend, I'm still going to have additional variation around that, and that's exactly what seasonality looks like. So we're going to have a shock there, which is again going to be a surprise relative to the trend. And then on the other hand, the level evolves sort of as the, the surprise relative to the deseasonalized data. And of course, we, we smooth that out. So it looks like three equations, but it's not actually that simple. In fact, we, had, we do have two equations. So we have one and two, the level and the trend. But st, in practice, is not one equation, but in fact, it turns out it's m distinct exponentially weighted moving averages, because we're always going to be looking back m periods. So in fact, for sort of period one, we're going to have an exponential weighted moving average with a large gap in it. For period two, we're going to have an exponentially weighted moving average with a large gap in it, all the way through period 12. So in fact, what we're going to end up with is 2 plus 1 exponential smoothing equations. So it could be large when m is big, but it doesn't always have to be. Um, you know, but this is sort of a, a sort of different structure. And again, the, the really common feature we see of all the exponential smoothing methods is that each of the components is allowed to follow a random walk-like structure. So here, the seasonal components will also behave like random walks, so that you do have to sort of update them. But the interesting thing about them is their forecasts are also going to be random walks, just like all the other components. And so one can easily just get the, um, you know, the forecast at every horizon, because once you sort of know the one step ahead, you know, we just need to know the sort of LT and the, the, the sort of, say, 12 seasonals in monthly data. Then we know the trend. The only thing that actually changes as we change H we obviously rotate around the 12 seasons. Obviously, we go with the first season, the second season, the third season, all the way through 12. When we get to the next step of the forecast, we're going to loop back around. So for example, imagine the first out of sample period was period 1. So the first period, the H1, would be used 1, 2, all the way through 12, in which case we'd be using sort of 12th seasonal cycle. 
Then when we get to 13, we'd actually loop back around to one. Because again, all these seasonal components are gonna sort of have random walk-like properties. So this is you know, the main idea behind the Holt Winters. It just extends the Holtz model to include sort of a, C, a set of M random walks where each one of the random walks is measuring the seasonal component in it. And it doesn't impose a lot of structure on the seasonality and it allows it to sort of change over time. Again, this may or may not be a sort of useful feature when it comes to forecasting data. Finally, just like before, we can damp the trends, just as one additional parameter, phi. So this is not particularly, you know, difficult or, or different from what we saw before. Again, it'll have the exact same pattern. So instead of having sort of a, a trend that will deviate forever, it'll have a trend that will eventually, you know, become finite as long as we have this phi parameter, particularly that it's sort of less than one. We'll see the same structure. Again, in practice, damping tends to help us. Prediction intervals are available from all of these models. Ultimately, deriving them is, is not particularly painful, but you need to, we need to understand some additional tools that aren't particularly insightful. That is, we need to understand a different representation of the models. Once you write them in this alternative representation, it's very straightforward because they're essentially just like the, the previous model, which what we saw the SES was an integrated moving average. They also have a similar ARMA type structure we can write them as. And so then once you have that, it's just a question of sort of crunching through the algebra and, and finding the terms. But prediction intervals always take the form of, you know, the forecast plus minus 1.96 sigma. This is of course a 95% prediction interval. Then the last thing we have is this sort of psi h. You can see the, the format for psi h is usually a fairly complex function. So here we always have psi h squared because these are like variances, I'm missing an h there. And you, know, you can see that they depend on things like the horizon. You know, we can see that we have one plus h minus one alpha squared. That's what we had for SES. But then adding the trend adds quite a bit of extra parameters there. So there's a lot going on there. Um, if we have damped, things get even more sort of tricky and you get some additional terms. Holt winters, you have the same expression you have for the trend or the Holt model in the beginning. But then of course you get a component of the prediction interval that depends on the fact that we have seasonality as well. So these are just things that one can implement. They are just at the end of the day, some numerical values that once you have alpha, beta, and gamma, you can do. But you know this allows us to construct prediction intervals at sort of all horizons. They're all gonna have the feature that they're all gonna depend on the sort of the horizon. You see H minus one of sort of shows up in, in all of them. And that's because at the end of the day, these are random walk forecasts. So when we have a random walk forecast, we know that prediction intervals are gonna get wider and wider because we believe, or the sort of the model is set up to believe that the data is gonna randomly walk around. And so the further you go in the future, the larger the prediction intervals will be. Finally, in conclusion, we saw Holtz model, which, which includes two exponential smoothers, one for the level and one for the trend. We also saw the Holt winter model, which has uses two plus M exponential smoothers, where M is the number of seasonal components. Again, all of the components in both of these models are allowed to follow their own random walks. Both models support damping, which allows the trend to grow, but not forever, unless it sort of have a finite sort of level. In general, this has been found to help these models. And finally, you know, using sort of standard tools, we can have prediction intervals for all of the models.